A few weeks ago, the International Monetary Fund downgraded the expectations in the British economy. They're now predicting a growth rate of possibly 0% for 2012. That is important because the policies of the coalition government, dominated by the Tories, are basically one of reducing the government deficit in order to promote economic growth. Since they've been in power, what they've actually done is cut public spending by about 120 billion, but they found they've only saved about 20 billion. Now this is a government which has 22 millionaires in the cabinet. Most of them went to public school, so you would assume that they have some intelligence. What is happening, however, is that when they cut, they reduce state income because people become unemployed and have to claim benefits from the state because they're unemployed, because the cuts have led to massive job losses, and the people who have become unemployed, they stop paying taxes, direct and indirect taxes. Because when you become unemployed, consumption falls, you buy fewer things. So the government deficit, instead of being reduced over two or three or four years, they're now talking about possibly two decades of austerity policies in order to once again balance the budget and get rid of the deficit. Now why is that important for the government? It's important because on a day-to-day -day basis, the government borrows money from the bond markets by selling government bonds. If the bond markets don't think that the government will be capable of paying them back, in other words, buying the bonds back from the bond market, then they will either refuse to lend to the government or they will give or they will charge the government a very high rate of interest, 7 or 8%. We saw the example in Greece where they were charging 40%. So the government believes it must have a policy of cutting. But then cutting prevents economic growth, and that is why you get the forecast. But what also cutting does is it attacks the living standards of working class people. Now instead of the government, for example, thinking how can we stimulate demand in the economy in order to promote growth, encouraging people to buy things, encouraging investment, carrying on with government spending or exporting their way out of the crisis, instead of doing that, they don't want to do it. On the one hand, people who, want, who may have wanted to invest in the past don't invest now because they cannot sell what they are producing with their existing industrial capacity. Government spending has to be cut or the bond markets won't lend the government money. Consumers are not spending as much as they had before because they are fearful of the future, but also because they have huge debts from the past that they want to try to pay off. And when they try to export their way out of a crisis, the problem is, is that every other country is trying to do exactly the same thing. So what the government is doing, it's, it's attacking what they call the supply side of the economy. They're trying to reduce, uh, the, for example, the rights of trade unions, the rights of workers. So, for example, if you become unemployed and you believe that you have been dismissed fairly, you could take your employer to an industrial tribunal. The government now says that you must put £1,000 in front of you before you can go to an industrial tribunal. It's talking about making it easier for employers to hire or fire labour. It's trying to make health and safety laws less stringent, less harsh, so that employers can actually get workers to work in any condition. These are the supply side of the economy. So what they are trying to do basically is carrying out an internal devaluation by reducing indirectly the standard of living of working class people and cut costs for employers. Now under the, in this situation, when working class people are faced with 20 years of austerity, then they have to fight back. And they are fighting back. There have been a number of strikes. But the desire to fight back is now being reflected inside the trade union movement. And it's been reflected in a number of different ways. The first manifestation of this anger of working class people took place on March the 26th, 2010, when the Trade Union Council, which organises the trade unions in Britain into one confederation, called a national, nationwide march and demonstration in London, which was the biggest in working class history. The Trade Union Council has now called for a similar demonstration on October the 20th. And the expectation will be that we could have between 1 million and 1.5 and million workers in London. Now the title of this campaign that the TUC is carrying out is the alternative for growth. And what is their alternative? The Trade Union Council. 
It calls for jobs. Well, that's obvious. If there's unemployment, you want jobs. It doesn't say how the jobs are to be created. The private sector won't create jobs because they want to boost profits. If they create more jobs, it's going to cost them more money. The public sector through the government or local government won't create more jobs because that will increase the government deficit. So there's no program for how jobs are going to be actually created. The TUC also calls for more investment. A justifiable demand, if you have more investment, then you have more machines for workers to use. But as I said before, if, people, if the industrialists, if the owners of the means of production cannot sell what they're producing now with the existing level of investment, what is the incentive to, to invest even more? And then they're calling for the government to carry out policies to boost the economy. The government does not decide economic policy. The markets, in particular the bond markets, decide economic policy. So while on the one hand the trade union movement is now up on its feet, it's awakening from a long period of slumber, on the other hand it doesn't have policies which mount any challenge to the existing system of capitalism. And it is a crisis of capitalism which is driving the agenda of the bond markets and therefore driving the agenda of the government. And that is why Marxists, why socialists, who are active in the trade union movement, constantly raise the question that you have to link the present crisis in capitalism in Britain with the need to change society, to transform society into a socialist society where the wealth that working class people produce through their labour will be used for the benefit of everybody in society and will not be appropriated by a small minority to make them even richer than they are now. And that is a crisis that we are faced with, is building that alternative. And there have been a couple of signs that something is beginning to happen. <clears throat> the biggest trade union in Britain, Unite, 1.5 million members, was an amalgamation of the Transport and Journal Workers Union, which represented uh, lorry drivers and, and, uh, and transport workers and so on, and dockers, and united with the engineering workers union called Amicus. Both of those unions had a socialist component in their constitutions. When they formed UNITE about six years ago, at the height of the economic boom, both of them decided to drop in the new union the socialist cause, which called for the socialist transformation of society. And everybody said, that's fine because we're in a boom of capitalism, we don't need socialism. Six years later, a few months ago, at the conference of UNITE, they passed a motion calling for, as a start, the public ownership of the banks and finance houses under democratic control. Now we have to define what is public ownership, what is democratic control. But that is a massive step forward for the United Trade Union. And the same happened in my trade union, which is a teacher's trade union. That also passed a similar motion. So there's an awakening of a socialist consciousness within the trade union movement. But it's still at a very low level, low level. And the people in the trade union movement, at the top of the trade union movement, still believe you can carry out Keynesian policies in order to boost the economy through government spending. One final example. In the past period, in the past two years, the Bank of England has pumped, through what they call quantitative easing, something like £375 billion into the economy. The latest uh, tranche of £50 billion happened a few weeks ago. What have the banks done with this money? Because this, banks has been, uh, this money has been given directly to the banks. The banks have said, thank you very much, we are going to put it into our vaults because we must rebalance our lending with the amount of money, the capital that we have within the, within the company. It's called recapitalization within the banks. So the, despite the Bank of England trying to stimulate the economy by pumping that amount of money into the economy, nothing has happened. The money has not been invested, the money has not even been lent out by the banks. All it shows us is that all the traditional measures of capitalism to solve the problem will not solve the problem, and the only measures that we need to fight for is the question of fighting for the socialist transformation of society. Start with taking the banks into public ownership, they triggered the present crisis, and then take the big monopolies into public ownership under democratic workers' control. We can then use the wealth that we produce in society to build schools, to build hospitals, to increase pensions, to increase wages, and build a massive standard of living for all. And we will decide when we have democratic control of society, we as working class people will decide how the wealth that is created by us will actually be spent and in whose interests. That is the task that lies before us.